morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us this morning. Um, today's press conference will have uh, five speakers. Uh, three of them will be uh, speaking remotely in our new era of uh, press conferences, and two are here with us today uh, in person. Uh, the five speakers are Sacramento County District Attorney Amory Schubert, El Dorado County District Attorney Vern Pearson, San Mateo County District Attorney Stephen Wagstaff, Kern County District Attorney Cynthia Zimmer, and the U.S. Attorney of the Eastern District of California, Gregor Scott. So, uh, once we're done with the five speakers, we'll have a short period of time to take some questions for everybody after that. So with no further ado, I'll introduce Amory Schubert from Sacramento County District. say over the last two weeks they've busted 44 people for fraud and for using stolen identities. They've seized 129 EDD debit cards with a value of more than two and a half million dollars. Investigators also confiscated several guns and nearly $290,000 in cash. They said the suspects are mostly from out of state and used the fraudulently obtained cards to rent cards rather to rent luxury cars, dine out, buy high-end merchandise, and stay at short-term rentals. Beverly Hills Police have now busted 87 people in less than two weeks for alleged EDD fraud and identity theft. Detectives say they recovered 181 fraudulent EDD cards with a value of over $3.6 million. They also found 466,000 in cash and seven handguns. Most of those arrested are not from California. 8% of the arrests in New York are out of state. said that there is no honor among thieves and there is no better example of this than the massive EDD fraud that is occurring within our jails in our prisons here in California tens of thousands of inmates local state and federal institutions all involved Every type of inmate that you could conceivably think of, murderers doing life or life without the possibility of parole, rapists serving hundreds of years of a sentence or perhaps life as well, child molesters, serial killers, and other murderers sitting on California's death row. Hundreds of millions of dollars that may well amount to upwards of a billion dollars having already been paid in their names. It is perhaps and will be one of the biggest fraud of taxpayer dollars in California history. And with this fraud it means that victims who have been victimized by these inmates are not getting the restitution that they so deservedly have uh, been owed. How did we get here is what we're going to talk about. What is the scope of the problem and how are we going to address this? I'll just talk for a few minutes about how, how did we get here. Well, we all know the pandemic started in March of 2020. We all know that there was massive unemployment as a result of that. 
in September of this year, just this fall, it came to light through some investigations by law enforcement, arrests by law enforcement, and prosecutions by some of the district attorneys you'll hear from today, that there was EDD fraud occurring on the streets of our communities, within the jails, and in the prison system. <clears throat> Beverly Hills was one of the leaders, as we heard already through that video. Well over 100 people arrested in that $3.6 million fraud scheme. And then came San Mateo County District Attorney Steve Wagstaff, who will tell you today about what they have done in their county. And then just in the last month or so, in late October, early November, state and federal prosecutors became aware of this massive problem. And as a result, just in the last month or so, we have formed a statewide EDD fraud task force so that we can tackle this massive problem. To give you a sense of the magnitude, as I call it, the behemoth of this fraud in our California state prisons, in early November, with tremendous collaboration and cooperation with the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, data was given both to the U.S. Attorney's Office, which was then shared to us, the task force, which was the entire list of CDCR inmate population across all prisons, across all demographics. And that list was then compared to the EDD claims that had been filed. And I keep in mind that this is only through March to August of this summer. A review of all of that data, which has just been done, quite frankly, in the last few weeks, is that the fraud is honestly staggering. And the types of inmate is shocking, quite frankly. It exists in every CDCR prison. It encompasses every type of inmate. It encompasses death row inmates. It encompasses inmates that have served or are serving life or life without the possibility of parole, clearly individuals that are not entitled to these benefits, that are so desperately needed by the working families here in this state that have been adversely affected by this pandemic. It involves rapists and child molesters, human traffickers and other violent criminals in our state prisons. And what we have found that many of these claims are being sent both in California, but also to out-of-state addresses and individuals. <clears throat> to give you a sense of the magnitude of just what we know of this snapshot between March and August, there has been 35,000 claims filed in the name of California state prison inmates. 35,000, and of those 35,000, as of August, 20,000 have been paid. The highest number of claims filed on behalf of a single inmate is 16 claims. And the total amount paid out for that snapshot is over $140 million. To give you a sense of the initial observations from the data that we received, again, with the tremendous cooperation of corrections and rehabilitation, <clears throat> there was money sent actually to prisons, paid and sent to inmates in prison. There are, there is evidence that true names of inmates and true social security numbers have been used to perpetuate this fraud. There's also evidence that there's been fake names and fake social security numbers. Fake names like John Doe or John Adams, or in one case, somebody had the audacity to put their name as poopy britches. We know from looking at the early stages of this data that there is both inmate fraud on their own regard, working cohort co conjunction with people on the outside at a massive scale. We also know that there's likely an identity theft people have stolen their identities and have uh, benefited from stealing that. What do we know about death row? Just a, a short survey of it. 
been 133 death row inmates that have claims in their names. 133. There's over 700 people on death row. The number of claims filed by those 133 inmate names are 158, which means that some filed more than one claim. <clears throat> the highest single claim paid is close to $20,000. Whether that was identity theft or not is a question we all need to answer, and we will. It doesn't take away the fact that that money was stolen from the coffers of the California state government. The total amount through August that we know of is $420,000 in the name of death row inmates. Who's on that list? A lot of notorious people of names, uh, claims filed in their names. Carrie Stainer, well-known serial killer. Wayne Ford, <coughs> convicted and put on death row out of San Bernardino. Some may remember he's the individual that walked into the sheriff's station in Humboldt County with a severed breast in his pocket and confessed to dismembering and murdering four women. Is Sarah O'Geary? He's the individual who tortured and killed Gabriel Fernandez in Los Angeles County. <clears throat> Became a Netflix stalker in Menory. Wesley Sherman time, well-known serial killer up here. Royal Clark from Fresno, another serial killer, killed two young women. Rex Krebs of San Luis Obispo. In San Diego, this is not unique to men. In San Diego County, a claim was filed under the name of Susan Eubanks. She murdered her four children. One of them was only four years old. The breadth of this fraud is massive. What are we seeing or what do we know about what's happening outside the prisons but within our jails and other detention facilities? In every uh, county we have a jail. We have 58 counties, each has its own jail. By estimates, it's somewhere around 72,000 in local jails. That's over and above the 100,000 or so that are in state prison facilities. Reports from law enforcement on this early stages of our uh, task force, we are talking about the same level of rampant fraud within the jails. Quite frankly, the inmates are mocking us. Even small jails are reporting losses within that small jail of over $10 million. The aggregate combined, simply by doing the math of the number of jails and the estimates within those jails could be in the hundreds of millions of dollars of theft from legitimate people that so desperately need it. We have concerns about state hospitals and any other detention facilities where people are potentially stealing identities or using their own to uh, calm the system. State hospitals, sexually violent predators, people that are incompetent to stand trial, not guilty by reason of insanity, and the list goes on. How could this happen? I'll talk about it a little bit. I'm sure uh, the district attorney from El Dorado, the president of CDA, Bern Pearson will as well. How could this happen? How could we be paying these types of claims? Well, the truth is, is because there is no system that's been utilized like 35 other states that already does to cross match jail and prison data to make sure that we are not paying people that are not entitled, inmates. That's how this happens. So with that being said, the question then becomes is we now know how could it happen. The question now becomes is how can we stop this? And I'm gonna turn it over at this point to Vern Pearson, El Dorado County District Attorney, uh, and also the president of the California DA's Association to help address that issue. Good morning, um, and again, as Amory indicated, my name is Vern Pearson, um, for purposes of this spelling, P-I-E-R-S-O-N, um, last name. I serve as the District Attorney of El Dorado County, as well as the President of the California District Attorneys Association. And I just want to give a, just a brief historical perspective in terms of this type of fraud. Uh, several years ago, the DA's Association met with the then director of EDD requesting access to uh, whether or not this type of cross-check uh, that uh, Amory alluded to, uh, uh, type of a tool existed uh, we were about five years ago. We were told that there was such a, a tool that existed in order to prevent this type of fraud. 
And essentially all we're really doing in that, in that case, uh, or what the state is doing, is, is a fairly simple process of looking at uh, jail public record, uh, jail booking information, uh, prison commitment information, and doing a, a entity resolution check comparison of saying, uh, are these people apl actively applying and receiving uh, benefits? Uh, as we, we we were aware that it, such a program did exist sometime in the past, but we're also aware that it has not been utilized here in the state of California, although uh, it's been used throughout the uh, rest of the United States and many other states. Uh, and we're also aware that fraud will always occur, so you have to have some type of measures to deal with that. Uh, but nothing could have told us the magnitude of this fraud. So the, the, the next speaker is District Attorney Steve Wagstaff, um, uh, who will appear remotely. Back in uh, the late summer, early September, his office, uh, and I'll let him go into the details of it, but they, they identified using, uh, uh, looking at jail conversations, or listening to jail conversations, I should say, the number of inmates that were talking about this type of fraud. Um, his office filed, and uh, he'll describe that in a moment, initial case. So we became aware of that. And then a short time later, uh, District Attorney Melissa Rios in Lassen County identified that within a state prison, uh, within Lassen County, or actually a couple of state prisons in Lassen County, the same type of uh, fraud was occurring. I should in note, in, 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 before moving on, and we'll, the other speakers will talk about this a little bit, this is a very, very simple way, a, a fraud to perpetrate. In other words, if you have relatively straightforward uh, identifying information, a social security number, perhaps even not even a real social security number, and uh, date of birth and an address out, uh, outside of an institution and occasionally inside of an institution, uh, you can apply. Because of the CARES Act, because of the COVID-related uh, uh, CARES Act uh, that went into effect, an individual was literally able to, like this last summer, uh, sitting in a custodial facility in El Dorado County, for instance, in my own county, to, to go online uh, uh, or have somebody on the outside go online on their behalf, fill out a very simple form, say, state that they've been unemployed since March, since the onset of COVID, and not only, and say that they previously had an income uh, due to their self-employment that they've now lost, and uh, uh, then they could go back and say, I would like to be paid retroactively back to the beginning of time uh, of this from March forward. So you can calculate out the amount of money, say it's two, three, four hundred dollars, depending on the income that they're stated, plus the additional six hundred dollars per week uh, of federal funding. You can easily get up to ten, fifteen, or even twenty thousand uh, dollars that would be mailed out uh, in the form of a debit card that does not require any identification for use. What we have learned over the last several weeks is that uh, repeatedly individuals would go to ATMs with a stack of, of uh, uh, these debit cards were moving up to $1,000 at a time. A very, very simple uh, uh, fraud that's being uh, uh, perpetrated. And it's spread, and as Anne Marie indicated, it's open and notorious within the correctional facilities being discussed about uh, how everybody's getting paid and we need to get ours, things along those lines. Um, so as we learned about this over the last several weeks, um, uh, increasingly the realization of this was that this was, while a simple fraud to perpetrate, it was a difficult uh, uh, crime to unwind given the, uh, the magnitude of the number of people, thousands of inmates in state, local, and federal institutions applying for it. Uh, you consider that, let's say Lassen County I alluded to, uh, having the, a, a relatively small DA's office and a vast number of inmates that uh, potentially have engaged in this. So in, in recognizing how large it was and that it is, it is essentially in every institution in a large scale, uh, we organized uh, a, a regional task force teams uh, throughout the state of California in order to try to, to wrap our arms around the magnitude of this. Um, we sent out a few weeks ago a bulletin to every law enforcement agency in the state of California explaining uh, what the cards look like, how easy it is to, to, to get the cash off the cards, how easy it is to apply, 
to notify every agency throughout the state of California, and we're continuing those efforts uh, to do that. And then, uh, um, most recently, um, we've had a series of, of Zoom calls with every DA in California, as well as every related law enforcement agency that uh, sheriffs and chiefs of police as part of that. However, uh, the magnitude of this is so much, the, and I'll just use the terminology, this is my own personal opinion, the dysfunctionality within our state uh, EDD uh, uh, department uh, to deal with this. And I, I will just tell you from the line level investigators, I'm told there are only 17 statewide that can aid in these types of investigations. At that line level, they've been very cooperative and very assistant with us in terms of seeing that this case, these cases are investigated. However, as you go up the chain of command, uh, there's been a series of uh, uh, re resignations, retirements, um, and there's really just a lack of responsibility on that side. And, and uh, as was alluded to a few minute, moments ago, vastly different experience that we've had with CDCR. The, uh, I was on the phone uh, yesterday, last night, with, uh, again, with uh, uh, Kathleen uh, Ellison, the director or secretary of CDCR. Uh, they have been very supportive of trying to get to the bottom of this, but the magnitude, again, is so vast, and it is not just uh, state prisons, it's, it's federal prisons as well in the state of California and, and the local county jails. Um, so much so that we reached the point yesterday that we made the determination that it was necessary to, to send a letter uh, that you'll receive a copy of, but we sent a letter directly uh, to the governor asking for the governor's personal involvement uh, to deal with this problem and to escalate the number of resources that are, that are being brought to bear on it and assist with a coordinated uh, collaborative effort to, to stop the flow of money going out and uh, uh, to, to assist us in investigating and prosecuting to the extent possible the people that are responsible for um, this enormous fraud, which as Anne-Marie alluded to, we believe at this point is the largest taxpayer fraud that's, that's uh, ever occurred in California history. Um, so we sent that a letter yesterday. I did speak, uh, uh, those of you who um, have followed like fires and uh, uh, every other calamity that might turn riots, things that took place in California, uh, the governor's head of uh, Office of Emergency Services, Mark Gilarducci, had a long uh, conversation with him today, and uh, he had indicated that he's been been uh, tasked by the governor to do what it was that we had asked to to uh, treat this as they have many other types of incidents, and assist with bringing more resources to bear uh, on the problem and, and do it in a collaborative, uh, managed manner. So. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over now to, to uh, uh, District Attorney of San Mateo, Steve Wagstaff. Thank you, Vern. I appreciate that. Again, I'm Steve Wagstaff. I'm the San Mateo County District Attorney. And I want to thank you for letting me join you today. The role of my office in this was that we sort of got it started. Back in July, of this year, one of my investigators, Inspector Jordan Boyd, was working on a case and he was reviewing jail, recorded jail phone calls of an individual in the San Mateo County Jail. The inmate started talking about a scam that he had heard about. And my inspector, rather than saying this has nothing to do with my case, I don't need to listen to this anymore, was curious. And he listened to the rest of the conversation that this inmate was having with a person on the outside about this new scam that was uh, that loads of inmates were taking advantage of here in the San Mateo County Jail and around the state. And they described it, they talked about it. And that's what caught the attention back in July here in the San Mateo County Jail of what's going on. So they followed up. My inspector followed up on this. We got that inmate. We took all the inmates' names that, that were mentioned in our jail, and we ran them through with EDD. Now it took some time, but we quickly found that indeed there was uh, loads of fraud going on in the San Mateo County Jail on the scam stealing from EDD using false uh, names, false ID. They were obtaining money 
and it was always connected to somebody on the outside. It was a combination of somebody on the outside working with the inmates, and this had been going on for months. This had been going on uh, really since the pandemic started. You know, idle time in our jails and our prisons gave them time to say, hey, let's see if we can make this scam work, and it did. You heard from the district attorneys of Sacramento and El Dorado the extent of it. Um, San Mateo County, it wasn't to that same extent. However, we did determine that there were 22 individuals who had pulled this scam off. They included people, four of them were people who had been either convicted or were facing charges of murder. One of them was simply awaiting his transportation to prison to serve his 95 years to life in prison for a horrific murder he had engaged in. Another one had already been transported to state prison. He was at Corcoran State Prison, and he was spreading the news throughout Corcoran about this scam he had learned when he was in the San Mateo County Jail. And like any pandemic, it spread all over our incarceration facilities. And that's what was being talked about here today. Now what's happened to those 22 individuals? Well, we filed charges on them, and we accelerated filing charges for this reason. What we learned through EDD, who was cooperative in providing us records and information, is that they could not cut these people off. The fraud was ongoing as we were investigating it. And what we were told is that under the regulations that they were all bound by at EDD, they could not cut the people off until we filed the charges. Not simply that we told them, hey, you know what? We've got the case, we're working it, we've established it, now we just have to process it. That in itself meant there was additional dollars paid out. We have prosecuted these 22 individuals. The cases are winding their way through our system. They've all been through a preliminary hearing and they're facing trial dates, except for there are six of them who have been convicted and they have been sentenced. For instance, that man facing 95 years to life in prison, he's now facing 98 years to life in prison. It's not a big ticket for what uh, he did, but there is punishment that uh, will be engaged there. That's what we're doing in each one of these cases. The real key here, the real thing is what has already been mentioned by DA Schubert and DA Pearson. The fraud is massive. In my county, it wasn't as massive as what you're hearing elsewhere, but we believe it accounts for probably a quarter million to a half million dollars in fraud just in Little San Mateo County Jail with these 22 individuals. That's massive. Think when you multiply that, by uh, hundreds of thousands of people. That's why you get the number that was mentioned earlier up to a billion. The answer is that there is money been stolen out of the pockets of every one of our taxpayers. That's money that the state could have been using to deal with the fires. That's money that we can deal with the economic uh, problems that we're dealing with now and we'll be dealing with in the future. That is offensive and that's why it is very important that the state of California, that Governor Newsom and his team join with the prosecutors, with the investigators, with the uh, federal authorities and the U.S. Attorney to make sure that these people, number one, stop everywhere, and number two, we get restitution. We've had restitution order in every one of the cases where there's been a conviction so far. That will be taken out of their money that they earn while they are in prison. That restitution will be made and that we stop this right now because it is massive. If this level of fraud can go on in a small county jail like San Mateo County Jail, you know that it's massive in other spots. Now I wanna turn it over to a district attorney who has not a small little jail in her county, but somebody who has five prisons and a very, very, uh, the fraud there, I can only imagine the challenge it will be for her. So at this point, can I introduce you uh, to Cynthia Zimmer from the uh, Kern County District Attorney's Office. Thank you. Thank you, um, and good morning. My name is Cynthia Zimmer, and I'm Kern County's District Attorney. Kern County has more state prisons than any other county in California. There are five state prisons within Kern County, and EDD fraud is running rampant within those five prisons. This first came to our attention at the Kern County District Attorney's Office by state prison investigators within one of our state prisons. In late September of 2020, 
the accounting department within one of these prisons received numerous money orders from the outside destined for inmates on the inside. These money orders were uh, thousands of dollars and dealt with a number of inmates. This was very abnormal and resulted in an investigation by the ISU units from within this particular state prison in Kern County. And this investigation determined that applications for unemployment benefits were made on behalf of inmates by persons on the outside who were friends and relatives of the inmates on the inside. The inmates, their cellmates, the inmates' friends. Um, and so these applications were made and EDP paid them thousands of dollars in the form of bank cards to the conspirators on the outside who cashed these bank cards then sent money orders to the inmates within the state prison. We have one filed case, we have more that we intend to file, and we are investigating many, many more. In the last two weeks, we've been able to determine that 4,000 applications for EDD benefits were made in the name of Kern County inmates. That's just our county. 2,382 inmates have received benefits so far, and the fraud in Kern County alone is over $16 million. The majority of the payees outside the prisons, those that are applying for um, uh, EDD benefits in prisoners' names, are payees within Los Angeles County. However, there are many within Kern County as well. For example, one address in Kern County, a conspirator on the outside who was collecting the money from EDD, collected benefits in the name of 16 different inmates. Uh, in my nearly four decades as a prosecutor in this state, I have never seen fraud of this magnitude. I am happy to be working with our partners throughout California to stop these injustices and hold these uh, offenders accountable. And at this point, um, I would like to turn over uh, the floor or the Zoom to our next speaker, our United States Attorney from the Eastern District, McGregor Scott. Thank you very much. Cindy, thank you very much, and good morning to you all. It's a pleasure for me to join you. Uh, now, you say to yourself, EDD is not a state agency, unemployment insurance is not a state issue. And the answer to both those questions is yes, but the reality of the fraud is really driven by the act of the federal government at the outset of the COVID crisis to supplement unemployment insurance. And that was done under the tune of additional $600 per week for each of the states, and then in turn, handed out by state agencies like EDD. So the point of that is to say, at the end of the day, this is money, not this state money that has been the department and the just have a vital role in the investigation and prosecution of this fraud. I speak on behalf of my three colleagues in San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco when I say that we are fully engaged in this process at the moment to invest in the state of California. Another measure that I would give you as we indicate the size and scope this problem in recent days my office has received authorization from the department of justice with funding to to employ an assistant united states attorney devoted solely to this edd fraud problem and that doesn't just happen the u.s attorney gets a special position to go after this we are working collaboratively with the district attorneys up and down the state 
Uh, we are very active members of the task forces that have been formed, as Mr. Pearson described. And we, uh, several weeks ago, working directly with the Department of Labor, we issued an administrative subpoena to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, which is what resulted in the list that Ms. Schubert referenced in terms of the inmates so that we could cross that, cross check that against EB. As I speak to you this morning, we have several open investigations on the federal side. The agencies involved in investigating these crimes uh, is, are several, principally the Department of Labor, the FBI, and many others. So we are ramped up and ready to roll. Uh, the last point I would make here this morning is that I served as the United States Attorney during the Bush 43 administration at the height of the mortgage fraud crisis in this country. And what we face now through this EDD fraud in terms of the number of persons and the size of the dollars that have been stolen, stolen is what has happened here. The only thing I can analogize this to is the mortgage fraud crisis that collapsed the American economy in the late 2000s. And I am proud to stand with my colleagues up and down the state of California uh, and I, just, I should point out as well, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, some county jails and California state prisons. We also are in possession of information that thousands of inmates at the federal penitentiaries in California have likewise undertaken this fraud scheme and are working thoroughly to investigate that and prosecute those cases when appropriate in the federal courts. So, so I'm to be with you. Uh, we are united in this approach, and we face a manifest problem that requires action, not talk. Thank you very much. Everybody on the screen, I'll let, I'll let you guys know that you're on our screen all up right now, so you're aware of that. <laughs> and um, we'll, we're ready to take some questions, um, and then we'll try to figure out who, who's best uh, suited to answer them as, as we go along. So, any questions? Yes. T uh, um, tell us who you are. Oh, um, my name is Anand. I work for ABC 10. Okay. Um, when I talked to DA Wagstaff previously, I'm oh, sorry. We have a microphone. Oh. Hey, uh, when I talked to DA Wagstaff previously, he said some of the inmates would just receive about a couple of years added to their sentence, and they're already serving close to life sentences. Has there be, been any consideration of stronger punishments for this? What type of punishments? Stronger punishments. Stronger punishments. Uh, Steve, I did not hear the question clearly. Could you repeat for me? Yeah, the question is since a lot of, or at least some of these people are already serving uh, massive sentences or will serve large sentences, is there any consideration for stronger punishment than just adding three years or so onto their sentence? Yeah, there's two answers to that. California law right now doesn't permit a greater punishment unless they have some of the people we've charged have prior strike convictions, and we are enhancing their sentences for that. But the core crime of conspiracy is a three-year max under California law. And of course, we as district attorneys would uh, do believe that there should be greater punishment for this type of fraud. However, the difficulty is that our legislature in recent years has not, in California, has not been receptive to increasing punishment. We're hopeful that perhaps in this arena, they might have a different viewpoint. Uh, but right now, the limit exists and there's no uh, moving outside it on a state level. Can I speak to that as well? Yeah. Yes, yes. So on the federal side, and this is again why it's vital that we are part of this process, we have uh, a crime on the federal side called aggravated identity theft. So what we all think of as stealing someone's identity uh, for fraudulent purposes, which carries a mandatory minimum two years in a federal penitentiary. No probation, no break, two years mandatory minimum. And oftentimes uh, with these types of cases, we will also charge and convict persons of other crimes on top of the aggravated identity theft. So we start with two years and then it only builds from there. So I just want to throw that in there. Any other thoughts on that question, guys? No, thank you. Okay, 
further questions? Hi, yes. uh, Vicki Gonzalez with KCRA. It's twofold. What's is there, the first one is, has there been a response or what kind of response from EDD about, about this fraud? And then the second question is, you mentioned friends and families on the outside were, were cooperating with inmates on the inside. Is there any ties to criminal organizations or are these just kind of lone individual instances that are at, as an aggregate total nearly a billion dollars? Okay, thanks. I put the two questions right here. Anne Marie's going to answer that. Um, the first question was about the response from EDD. Um, I would say, and, and I think Mr. Pearson said this earlier, it's, it's been um, slow if non-existent, to, at least to the task force. I, I would give credit to the investigators who are working very well, but we've made a number of efforts to reach out to their top-level management and haven't really had any response from that. Um, as to friends and family, is it, is some people call them one-offs. Is it one-offs? Um, there's a lot of combination of both. There's very, very organized rings that are perpetuating these frauds. Um, a very, very extensive, uh, multiple uh, cars sent to individual addresses, both across the jails and the prisons and likely from the outside. So this is some uh, very, very organized theft rings uh, the to, to the tune of millions of dollars. <coughs> Any other questions? Um, is there anything? That, oh, sorry, Jessica with Fox 40. Is there anything being done to recuperate the money that's already been paid out? Can anything be done? Anybody want to take a shot at that one? I'm sure, it's something that we would we will be wanting to do. Uh, there are limits on what we can do at this point. I think there's two parts to it, and remember, there's dozens and dozens of investigations ongoing right now. So. But there's two parts to it. There's people on the outside ripping off the system, and there's people on the inside that are participating in that ripoff. And so while we may not get much more out of a death row inmate, you can rest assured that we're going to do everything we can to, to, quite frankly, nail those people on the outside. And there's ways that EDD, and, as well as the criminal justice system, whether it's like Mr. Wagstaff said, seeking restitution, but EDD has their own tools uh, of being able to garnish wages and things like that. Um, but you know, the, remember, like I made this comment before, Every inmate in state prison that has victimized a person has left somebody behind, and in many of those cases, they are owing restitution to those victims. And so we're just further damaging them because they're not getting what they're entitled to as well. Let me add something to that, too. Um, as a taxpayer, all of us need to be really angry about this. As has been alluded to, we're talking about not a, a insignificant amount of money. Statewide, we're talking about, at a minimum, hundreds of millions of dollars, as much as a billion dollars of fraud. And because that system and the, the EDD uh, department is so dysfunctional, there is a, has been a backlog, there continues to be a backlog of, of uh, uh, many, many thousands of people who have, because of the pandemic, because of the uh, lockdowns and others have lost their their employment and they're unable to get money because they don't know the system the same way the inmates do and they don't know how to go through the process and to get these things done and one of the things that we've seen through the uh, stages of investigation is that typically the, these types of claims get paid out very quickly because they know that, that you know they communicate with each other and they say this is how you fill the form out this is the information you have to make sure that it's in in there so uh, yes and to your point directly we are owed as taxpayers uh, uh, both at the, the, the state level and individual level we're owed hundreds of millions of dollars but the practical reality is uh, when you're talking about thousands of convicted felons that are engaged in this behavior Despite best efforts, the practical reality is the vast majority of this money will never be repaid. And I think it's important to note that. And yes, we are going to try to do, as, as uh, DA Wagstaff said, try to get orders, try to go after. But I mean, think about it from the standpoint he's saying. Someone that's already serving uh, uh, essentially a life term who's ripping off the taxpayers, and uh, uh, there's no practical way that money's ever going to be repaid by him. Uh, and these are criminals committing crimes, so that the, the limitations are there despite the best efforts to recover uh, uh, restitution for that. 
I think there's one other thing that is really important for folks to understand, and Mr. Pearson mentioned it earlier, is it's not just about the money that's been stolen. It's about the fact that we need to turn off the spigot, which means that we should not continue to pay these convicted felons who are in prison. And that's part of the letter that Mr. Pearson references, that we have asked and implored the governor to get involved himself to turn the spigot off. Because right now, there is no cross-matching between the incarceration data and EDD on a routine basis like it's being done in 35 other states. And if we have that spigot shut off, we're gonna reduce the amount of money that's flowing to these individuals, these criminals, these murderers, these rapists, uh, in a very short order. It is time to turn that off. Any further questions? Okay. Uh, Dennis from CBS 13, Sacramento. Uh, any comment on the EDD still sending out social security numbers in their mailings? I don't think we'll be able to comment on that. It's, I know it's tangentially related, but not directly, so sorry about that. We have another question? Yes. Follow up. Um, so when I reached out to EDD, they said, it, they said that the IDV system would help stop this. Have you noticed that has that helped at all, or are you still continuing to see inmates still getting paid out for this? So, so the, so the, the, just to understand this. So, as uh, uh, EDD was learning that uh, the magnitude of the fraud and what was going on uh, in the last uh, several months, uh, there was some outside assistance from uh, uh, a other. Uh, people looking into it and trying to advise them on what to do and how easy the fraud was to perpetrate and as the, just to answer the question in terms of there was a a system put in place that was supposed to help stem some of this and that basically what it would do is require a photograph or an identification to be submitted as part of that and I think that's a significant improvement and a significant help the problem is what we know is from listening to to jail communications and prison communications in other words people that are in custody uh, in jails and their 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 phone calls are are recorded uh, and we know that they're talking amongst themselves about how easy it is to defeat that and how to do a workaround so then they will call to somebody on the outside get a driver's license get some other type of identification and then the money continues to flow so it, it is an improvement but it's certainly not an overall correct, uh, uh, fix to the problem Any other questions from people inside? I think we might have some questions from folks who are uh, listening in remotely. Yes. Uh, so Anita Shabria from the Los Angeles Times, and looks like the same question came from Sean Hubler from New York Times. Can the DAs confirm that a claim was made in the name of death row inmate Scott Peterson? That's true. There was a claim made in the name of Scott Peterson. Stephanie Sierra from ABC7 Los Angeles. We've heard from elected leaders there is fear this fraud is being perpetrated from help by people inside the EDD. Is there any evidence to suggest that may be true? Well, uh we would not be able to comment on that, even if, uh, if whether it's true or not. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Sorry about that. Adam Beam from the Associated Press. How many people have been arrested and charged? And of those, how many are outside of the prison system? I don't know if we have a direct number, but um, of the folks here, Steve uh, or maybe Cynthia could give us some help on that. I only know the numbers for San Mateo County. There are 22 people charged. 21 of them um, are uh, in, either in custody or facing it. And of that number, six were outside helping the ones inside. And uh, again, out of our 22, uh, four of them have been convicted so far. The others, their cases are pending. 
And I know, Cynthia, you okay. mentioned a few. Yes. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, most of our cases are currently being investigated. Of the one case that we have filed and that uh, charges are pending in court, two are outsiders out of Los Angeles County that were helping inmates within Kern County. And then I could just add to that that there's literally dozens of investigations going on statewide and it's just going to continue to grow um, but as far as actual cases filed uh, that's probably most of them at this point steve if i could uh yes if i could chime in there so we have indicted a handful of people actually formally been indicted by the grand jury in sacramento and fresno thus far and uh, we have lots and lots of open investigations right now and the people we have indicted to date were not inmates. These were just people out of the street perpetrating this crime. Okay, great, thank you. Any more questions from inside the room or outside? It looks like maybe a couple more from remote. Dispatch. Yes, thank you. Uh, Sean Hubler from New York Times has a follow-up question on the Scott Peterson question. He wants to know if anyone can verify how, how much fraud was associated to him. I think we know the number at this point, but we're not going to bring that. We, that could be an active investigation at some point, so we're gonna to have to decline to answer that one. We have a question from Astrid Kassemeyer, Bay City News. Is there any evidence that people on the outside were coerced into assisting inmates with filing fraudulent claims, or were they acting independently? Does anyone wanna to speak to that? I think we don't necessarily have evidence of it, but the investigations will probably reveal whether people were actively involved, willingly, unwillingly, whether some of the people who were inmates uh, were not involved at all, but their identifications were stolen or coerced from them in the facilities. We don't know that yet, but we'll, we'll be finding out soon. Okay, uh, we have Wes from the Sacramento Bee, and the question is, is there a specific action that Governor Newsom can take to, quote, turn the spigot off as you said, and stop paying these claims. I think the immediate action that needs to happen is that we need to adopt what other states are doing. I don't think any of us are naive enough to believe that a massive governmental organization will take some time, but there are vendors, companies that have been doing this. We, I mean, just speaking from a county, we cut off welfare benefits to people that are in our county jail and we have a system in place. It's not, it, 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 I don't want to say it's a simple process, but turning the spigot off means that we expedite the imposition of this system that exists in other states to do exactly what we're asking to be done. And then I have another follow-up question from Misaki. Uh, can the U.S. Attorney talk a little bit more about the source of the money that has been stolen? Was it federal or state funds? Did you get that, McGregor? The source of the money that's been stolen, is that right? Yeah, it's federal or state yeah. funds. Yeah, so it, it's it's a mix of the two, um, but I feel confident in saying that the, uh, the very strong majority of that money came from the federal government, largely in the form of the $600 per week supplemental unemployment insurance that was passed by the Congress back at the advent of COVID in, in, in March. So uh, that I don't have a dollar number around that. I, I don't know what those numbers are, but it, this is federal money at the end of the day. Okay, thank you. A follow-up question from the New York Times. Are you working with other states on any of these fraud cases? And if so, which ones? Are you talking? Uh, are you asking McGregor Scott that question or all of us? It should be to the panel, to all to of you. Panel. I don't think we are. Right? Well, can I just stop? Anne Marie. Oh, sorry. I mean, let, let's be honest here. This is a, as the words I've used, it is behemoth. This is a massive amount of work that needs to be done. The information that we are relaying today was really just evaluated in the last couple of weeks. And yes, there's money going out of state. There's money going out of this country in the names of individuals that are in prison. And so those investigations will be undertaken in the most organized way we can. 
obviously targeting individuals that have the largest amounts of money, the most structure, and those of that magnitude. But it is to underscore the complexity of this fraud, it, it, it's, there, there's no description of how complex it can be. But the answer to that question will be dependent upon every jurisdiction on wh where the money uh, goes and what they choose to do with those investigations. Hey, uh, Steve? Yeah. That's great. Steve? Yes. Gregor Scott. Yeah, I, I just want to provide one, uh, one additional point on the, about the sort of money. And I, and I, I said this at the end, said, but I want to make sure we're clear on this. Yes, it was federal money, but the way this works is the federal government passes it to the states, and the states are responsible for the actual distribution. And in California, that's EDD. So this fraud problem is one that rests at EDD, not with the feds. Just want to be clear on that. And just to finish up the one question about working with other states, um, I wasn't sure myself. And I don't know that we're actually working with any other state agencies and groups at this time, but um, we know we're aware of the fact that there is fraud in other states. And so uh, if that opportunity arises, Sure, we'll, we'll be doing it. And as Steve began, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, the Department of Justice has a nationwide task force to deal with this, and uh, each United States attorney in the nation has been asked to designate a coordinator within his or her district. And uh, my folks are the regular participants in that process. So, so there, from that perspective, there is multi state coordination. Thank you. One more question back there. There was a follow up question from the LA Times. Can the San Mateo DA clarify if he has filed on 21 or 22 cases? Steve? I need your help, Steve. I couldn't hear it. Uh, did you, how many cases did you file on? 22 or 21? We filed on 22 people. One person's at large. He posted $1 million bail. We think at least a portion of that was with ill gotten gains from EDD fraud. But the other 22 we've charged our court. The other one, he has a million dollar arrest warrant out for him. Thank you. Looks like someone's uh, texting one in. No, that's it. Any anything else, folks? Do you want to finish up? Oh, okay, that's it for the press conference. Thanks. Oh, thanks thank a lot. We'll oh. send out the letter. Um, just the letter was sent to the governor and will be distributed. Okay. We'll distribute the letter that was sent to the governor um, shortly. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, thanks a lot. Thank you, Steve. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Cindy.